what's up? Welcome to another new episode of What's Up Conversations. In this episode, my guest is the legend behind the visual of Assassin's Creed franchise, art director of Prince of Persia trilogy, and the newly released Assassin's Creed Valhalla. That's amazing! Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Raphael Lacoste. This sounds like the beginning of a very interesting story. Please make sure to subscribe, follow, and share this podcast, because it would really help a lot. You can watch What's Up Conversations on YouTube, and you can listen to it on all the major podcast streaming services. Okay, let's go. For more information, follow my website, www.nikofarmusic.com, Nikofar with double O, or find me on Twitter at HRNikofar, or Instagram at Hamid Reza Nikofar. To follow the amazing work of Raphael, I've put the links to his social media pages in the description of this episode. How would you like that? All right, let's synchronize and take a leap of faith. Hello cool. and welcome to What's Up Conversations, Raphael. It's such an honor to have you on the podcast, sir. I mean, you're one of my favorite artists ever. Like, there's Da Vinci, cool. Turner, Thanks. and there's you. So it's so good to see you. <laughs> like, more than good to see you. All right. So uh, a week ago, I posted on my Instagram page that you're my next guest. And I was bombarded with so many questions to ask from you. I'll try to ask them with my own questions and pass it to you as much as possible. So let's go. First of all, yeah. congratulations yeah. on Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I've been playing it since the launch. And as a huge Assassin's Creed fan, I love it so much. As you can read it from my face. <laughs> <laughs> the game is doing great. <laughs> the best launch in the series, and it must feel amazing to release yet another masterpiece in the franchise. At this point, do you even worry about releasing a bad Assassin's Creed? Oh, you know, uh, you know, I've been around in this franchise for a long time. Uh, I shipped a few games, uh, a couple of <laughs> AC games. And uh, I would say the the, the the challenge is always to uh, to be able to to ship the most beautiful, the most interesting world, and the most uh, you know touching and and charismatic characters. Uh, so every time it's uh, it's something we we want to push to the next level. Uh, but this year was uh, even more a challenge because we we got the pandemic, we we got the twenty twenty curses and all this stuff. So I would say like we always want to 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 make a better game, always want to push details and. I'm really happy with, with what we what we have now, but I would, if I could, I would like to push more some details. And I, I still see some annoying stuff when I'm playing the games. Ah, oh, shit! These particles, uh, these details are not working. We we should push that. Uh, this level of details, you know. But uh, there's a point when you you need to to let uh, the the baby go. You need to let the the baby uh, go uh, safely to bed, and 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 you need to to move on uh, something else. But uh, no, I, I'm super proud for the for the launch of this game for the team. Uh, Business-wise, it's been uh, amazing for Ubisoft, I think. And uh, I would say on the um, on the world building and the world crafting, I'm really proud of uh, what the team uh, achieved and the on, on the lighting as well. Yeah, again, congratulations you to you and your team. So let's jump on the animus and go back to your childhood. When you look at your yeah. life's journey, what are the important parts that made your today's inspiring and successful character? Uh, when I'm looking back, uh, back, you mean at, uh, my experience, my own life or yeah, yeah, my... your, yeah, yeah, your own life from childhood up until now. Oh, until, uh, until now. Yeah. I, I think, you know, uh, inspiration is not something that is, uh, uh, falling from the sky. It's really, uh, coming from, uh, who you are, where you've been in your life and, uh, what you've been working on. And I think it's a question of personal interest in things and, um, yeah, inspiration is coming from your family first. You know, my dad was a was a photographer, even if he he, he ended to be a, a doctor at the end. But um, uh, we lived in uh, Algeria when I was a baby, when I was a kid, uh, until I was two years old. And I think, you know, this love for uh, open landscapes, uh, quiet nights, and uh, being able to be alone, and <laughs> it's, it's a part of my personality. And I think it's coming from this time I spent, you know, in, in the oasis, in the, this very, very quiet place and, and beautiful and open uh, landscape. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, like, if you're an artist, you've been raised next to a shipyard, maybe you will love to, to draw ships and, uh, and flying ships like Ian McHugh, maybe, you know. And um, as, a, as an artist, uh, I'm always fascinated by, by nature and open landscape. And I think that's something that really forges your character, where you've been through and 
for sure, inspiration is also a question of work and crucial interest in things. Yeah. So uh, following that, I believe the artist taste of an art, the artistic taste of an artist uh, comes from his or her surroundings, the people you've been in contact with, the environment, the country and the culture you're living in. Uh, you're gr a great word builder. I love your work because I can relate to them. It takes me to a whole new world and yet it leaves a lot to my own imagination to occupy some parts of it. And then by doing that, it becomes something very personal for me and for any other person who's experiencing your work. How does your surrounding affect, uh, affect your work? And uh, again, what were uh, the influential real life factors in your life that ended up uh, shaping your artworks today? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, I, uh, I know there's a lot of people uh, working, and especially with, I would say like a young uh, artist, and they, they don't uh, misunderstand what I'm saying. They are, like, there are a lot of very talented young people, but uh, they work a lot from the computer and they, they take inspiration from the web, from, uh, from photos, uh, even from all the artists work and I think it's uh, it's okay but there's a there's a limitation to that because you end to to repeat yourself and to do self-referencing you know it's always about references and 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 self-referencing you know it's it's not uh, as open and creative as an inspiration that is coming from uh, traveling or spending time um, looking back at the classics you know for instance um I know no, we're we're very cursed with the, with this whole pandemic situations. So traveling is not an option, but you can just go out, um, take a hike. You know, uh, if you live in a nice country, uh, maybe there's a nice nature to discover. Do some beautiful hikes in the nature. But if you live in a very urban setting, that could be also an inspiration to go to the back alleys and take photos. You know, at night or maybe at dawn. Um, maybe there's a beautiful park. You can take pictures, reference from trees there. And use that in your in your stuff. I think it's more interesting because if you want to have like a personal, like a personal touch, like really something that is really about yourself and your your own trend, you need to spend time outside and and you need to uh, leave. You know the I would say the office. You need to leave the computer and, and spend time. Inspiration is also taking a step back. I think taking a step back. You know, with your stuff, with the the all the reflex you have, all the all the habits you have, the tech, the techniques and all the stuff you're using. So yeah, I think the step back is, you know, the best step back is meeting people, uh, traveling. I think for me, it, it has been a great experience because it's really can, it's a confrontation of your, your own, you know, work and your own like, uh, belief with, uh, the culture of other people and, and all the cultures. So when we'll be able to travel again, I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's going to be uh, very useful for a lot of uh, people. Yeah. So uh, someone asked me, to, uh, asked me to ask you a very in interesting question. He told me that there are lots of artworks he, wanted to, he wants to do, but he's always concerned and afraid that he's not yet ready to approach them. You know, those feelings that you have an awesome idea but, uh, about an art book and you're like, ah, I got I to gotta learn more before I approach it. Now this could be a never-ending process, an exercise in futility. What suggestions do you have for this particular situation that many of us could find ourselves in? Uh, you mean uh, not being confident enough to uh, yeah. to start something? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, I, I think you you have to listen to yourself. If you don't feel you're ready, you're not ready. And I think it's important to listen to yourself because uh, rushing an idea is not good. Rushing any project is not is not a good option either. But waiting too much and being not confident is is not good for the soul. So I think there's there's a balance to find. Uh, for instance, I I had the chance to 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 work on uh, some personal stuff, but I didn't have the time. So I was not rushing. I was like thinking about. Uh, uh, this new illustration and, you know, this new book I could make. And it took me years to achieve that. And I think the time I, I used to, to make, uh, the two art books was very useful because I, I had a step back. I could see, okay, these drawings are not good enough for the book. These drawings, I'm, I'm not going to, going to keep them. I'm going to work more. I'm going to, to do, uh, more stuff. I, I'm going to watch, uh, 
um, traditional illustrators and you know and, and maybe look at uh, engravings as reference as well and spend more time working. So I think yeah, you're right. It's it's a tricky question because it's it's really a balance between um, keeping the you know the faith uh, and and be able to 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 be confident enough to to show your stuff to people and not rushing things because that's that's that could be a problem as well because you will leave marks you know it's uh, if you make something that is tangible uh like an art book for instance uh it's going to last for years so yeah. you you, yeah, you have to take your time and uh, i think uh, also um some, some, some just working on small things not big projects like uh, go um with Sure, you can have ambition, but uh, don't go over what you you can deliver. You know, go with something that is doable, uh, tangible, and uh, where you can really try uh, and experiment your ideas. Yeah, sometimes you have to take a leap of faith, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's totally right. That's totally right, and that's exactly the feeling you have. So it's a good comparison. It's exactly the the idea of uh, and and you know, I, I'm I'm personally I really like. Uh, uh, when artists are not too confident, I think when an artist is super confident, there's there's something wrong there. Uh, it's because there's not enough, um, um, you know, questioning about uh, your personal uh, uh, identity and your personal talent. Uh, like usually, super talented artists are not confident. They always yeah. rethink the ideas. They 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 don't take everything for granted. Um, uh, but there's again a balance to find between like being not confident at all and and too confident so that's uh, that's the tricky thing for for artists even when they get a lot of recognition uh i i know a few artists they are still very humble people and uh, they have always this self criticism which is sometimes a bit toxic but uh, which is i think it's good when you want to evolve when you want to to get better at your, at your shit yeah. So uh, there's this quote from uh, Da Vinci that art is never finished, only abandoned. When do you abandon your work? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. So yeah, artists uh, never finish. They they just abandon the stuff. Uh, maybe it's you can more apply that uh, to uh, uh, Da Vinci because he was really <laughs> he was not finishing his stuff. It's he is well known <laughs> for that. Uh, on my side, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe because uh, I've been playing music and uh, when I was a kid, uh, uh, a teenager, I was, I was composing stuff on, uh, with uh, MIDI instruments and uh, computers and synthesizers. And I always wondered, I don't know why, but I was starting a tune and I wanted always to finish it. You know, it, it had to be, you know, from intro development to the conclusion of the music. I don't know why it's like, and it was not very good, but I had to do something from A to Z. So it depends on the people. Uh, and, and also, as a professional artist, I, I like when I conclude something. When I, when I can say, okay, it's finished. And, and usually it's, it's the case. Um, not on everything. So like I, I was saying about Valhalla, there's a lot of stuff I would like to push. I would like to, okay, we need to produce, you know, these kind of details. And, and there's a lot of technical things I still want to, to polish on this game. But uh, there's a point when you need to let go of things. And when you tell, you know, you were saying abandon, that that's not abandoning a baby. It's not a good image. <laughs> it's very sad. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's, a, there's some of that, I would say. You're right. Yeah. So I'm a video game composer. And oftentimes when I'm not making music for a game, I look at concept arts. I follow concept artists more than music composers. Because yeah. visual cues are very influential for me. What what are some of your different and somehow odd sources of inspiration? Um, yeah, yeah. So it depends when it's a personal thing or when it's a professional uh, topic. You know, if 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 I have to, to do a book cover, for instance, for for uh, you know an edit editor, uh, I will read a part of the book. Or I will have some. Uh, some uh, samples of the book I would read, I would go through the text and the text will, will give me inspiration. And I love this kind of uh, opportunities because there are a lot of new ideas coming. When you are like just uh, cycling through your own ideas and turning circles with your own inspiration, sometimes it can, you know, repeat, you know, you can feel the repetition, you can feel a pattern, you know, coming through your, your self-inspiration. And when you get the opportunity to read books and, and have maybe some... Uh, contracts where they ask you something very specific, but it's maybe out of the comfort zone. You know, that's, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting. 
And, um, and I, I took a lot of inspiration from, you know, reading books, even if I'm not reading a lot, but uh, sometimes just reading, you know, pages or uh, watching movies, uh, listening to mu music as well. Um, and for sure, traveling. Traveling is also a lot of uh, great uh, source of inspiration. Uh, taking photos, I'm taking a lot of pictures. Uh, I've been uh, in the, the fine arts as well as uh, I was in art and media and was taking into account photography and, and video and audio as well. So, yeah. If I would say taking photos and I have the, now with, with my phone, you know, I can take photos by night. It's uh, it's pretty efficient. And uh, I love, you know, being able to see things that the eyes can't really see because it's it's so dark, but the, the I don't know how they make this, but the, the phones, the cameras yeah. now can see in the dark. It's like, what the heck is that without any flash? But you can see, you know, the details in the shade and and also the the the, the color temperature, like the neon will end maybe green and and, and and um, and something like uh, very bluish, and and you would have also the incandescent lighting, more orange and and warm. So it's a, it's an interesting way of uh, studying light and finding inspiration as well. Yeah. By the way, what kind of music do you listen to when you're working? Oh, I, I listen to uh, so many kind of music, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening to. Uh, uh, I love you know some electronic. I, I love uh, rock up, for instance. Uh, I would listen to the Bush mode. I would listen to. Uh, classical music, uh, Stabat Mater, Vivaldi. Uh, um, you know, there's there's a big range of uh, music I like. As soon as it's good, and uh, and it's funny because it's also the people uh, you know around you. They can give you new ideas to you know listen to new stuff you would have never listened. Like my my son, my kids, uh, they're coming with the uh, Juice uh, Juice World, yeah, and all this stuff. And there's some pretty cool stuff. Like I, I find some like some some tunes are really 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 good and. Uh, I'm listening. I'm listening to, to new stuff thanks to my kids as well. But uh, yeah, I would say like I've been listening a lot to uh, M83 and uh, ambient music. When when I when I'm listening to when people sing, um, I don't know how. Yeah, sometimes it's uh, it's uh, taking me out of inspiration or, or more yeah. like uh, I would say like focus. Yeah. Uh, when I hear a voice, sometimes it's like uh, yeah, I, maybe uh, having a. ADHD, I don't know, about <laughs> disorder, trouble attention, I don't know. But uh, yeah, when I hear people uh, talking or speaking or singing, sometimes it could be a bit disrupting when I'm when I'm trying to focus on something. So that's what about why singing I, in I different try. languages? Yeah, maybe different language. When that I don't opens a whole anything. new mystery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's that's right. Yeah, maybe I should uh, listen to your Persian music. I don't know, like uh, <laughs> something different. That would. Uh, I, I don't get uh, what they say, and then it's more like a, like a melody and music. And um, yeah, I would say like, yeah, sometimes it's more classical or uh, ambient music, uh, like uh, MED3 and uh, yeah, it's kind of stuff. Right. So uh, what are some important characteristics of an art director? How do you recognize one? Hmm. Oh, that's a good question. There's a, a big range <laughs> of characters there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say the the ones I, I, I like uh, the most, and uh, when I, I'm trying also to 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 keep that keep that as inspiration also for myself, it's uh, being a, a kind person, um, but also very demanding, and um, giving inspiration, being like really, um, I would say like staying always in focus in your direction, so you don't lose the people in uh, many different directions, and they. They, they they can feel like uh, you don't know what you want to do, and that's really bad because you need to be respected by the by the team, and you meet, you need to be an example, and you do, you need to be also an inspiration. Um, you need to be kind as well because you know artists are very sensitive. So if you're you know this kind of dictator, you you like a like a, a the toxic guy, it's not possible to work with people, and people we we know that, and they will escape from the the team. So. And eventually, if they are stuck with you for one game, they will leave after, you know. So it's uh, it's uh, it's it's really not easy. It's very tricky because we we take a lot lot of stress on, on ourselves. Uh, we have a lot of pressure as directors. We 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 need also to uh, to balance a lot of things with the uh, you know, narrative and game design, and we need to have sometimes some fights. Um, it's it's a huge challenge, and um, you need to to keep that you know out of the of uh, the, the office when you when you do some reviews with artists, you need to be the kind, inspiring person. But you need also to be very demanding. So when someone doesn't deliver and it's not working, 
uh, and you're working on a triple A game and there's a lot of pressure and you need to, to shoot the best quality possible. Um, sometimes it, it can be very hurtful, but yeah, you, it's not just not working sometimes, but, yeah. uh, yeah. Uh, how many art leaders do you have for a project like Assassin's Creed Valhalla? Oh, we have many, we have many, we, uh, we, I, I would, I would be working with a few leads, uh, in Montreal. So, uh, I have uh, a lighting lead, uh, uh, I have a lead uh, for the natural environments, the nature, the you know the vegetation. I have a lead for architecture. Uh, I have almost four or five uh, leads working under under myself on the, on the team in Montreal. And then uh, there there are a few art directors working also for the different uh, Ubisoft studios in the world. So uh, Singapore, Sofia in Bulgaria, uh, in Montpellier in France. Um, in in uh, in Spain as well in Barcelona, so we 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 have a few art directors and leads uh, reporting to me and working with me on, on the game. So I have a few phone calls uh, when it's with Singapore. It could be like uh, very late in the evening in Montreal or very early, uh, and and when it's in Montreal, usually uh, we 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 have a few uh, sync also with the people from Montreal and the other studios. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty big uh, it's a big ship we need to yeah. steer. <laughs> Do you also uh, consult other uh, art directors on other games from Ubisoft, for example, Watch Dogs? Uh, so sometimes we get in touch, but uh, I realize we don't spend enough time with the uh, the other games uh, because we are so busy uh, reviewing the game, uh, working on Inception. Um, after that, we, we're playing the game and also spending so much time uh, debugging uh, that we we we. Yeah, we, we sometimes we forget to have a step back and talk with other art directors. We used to have a few meetings with other art directors in, at Ubisoft, but I think it's not uh, it's not enough. Uh, usually, also because uh, I have a lot of experience at Ubisoft Montreal, uh, I get in touch with other art directors more. Like I would say, junior art directors who want to have feedback on their work. And when I have the time, I'm happy to give some feedback. But usually, we are so busy uh, on the game that it's it's difficult. Um, but, but what I what I like uh, for me, uh, one of the the most uh, important thing is to have uh, recognition and also exchange with the other pairs of the industry. So when, when, you know, when I can get in touch with, uh, with uh, Nicolas Bouvier, who is an uh, art director on, on Halo at Microsoft, or uh, someone like uh, Rafael Grasselli working for uh, Sony Santa Monica on, on God of War, or you know, John uh, working on, uh, on The Last of Us, you know, all these guys, uh, when, they can, you know, when they say they like uh, the game I'm making, it's like, oh man, that's the best compliment I can have. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, let's talk about Assassin's Creed. To this day, I've had three important people from the franchise as my guest on the podcast. Patrick Disley, creative director of the first two Assassin's Creed, Alex Hutchinson, director of AC3, and you, sir. And I think you're the oldest and most involved person in the creative team of the franchise. So I guess you're the right person to ask this question from, how do you guys decide about the setting of each Assassin's Creed? How is the process of choosing a time and a location in history? Uh, yes, I'm the only one left in the, <laughs> the brand. <laughs> uh, you're right. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, indeed we, we, we do as a team, uh, we do have, uh, ideas. We, we do want to, to explore settings and, and time periods. And <clears throat> something that is really cool and fascinating about this brand is that you, you don't have, you're not stuck in one fantasy in one era. You can move you know, from one era to another fantasy. And that's, that's what I really like about AC. Uh, that's why I think I've been lasting on this brand for so long, because uh, if you want to bring to life the, the, the fantasy of the pirates, you, you can do it with AC4. If you want to push the fantasy of the Viking, it's Valhalla. If you want to push, uh, you know, the, the immersion in the in ancient Egyptian world, you, you, you go in origins. Uh, industrial era in, you know, 19th century London, it syndicates. French Revolution. So all, all this stuff is so different. Um, and people who don't know the brand or maybe look at the, the brand in, through a, a keyhole, they would say, oh, Raph, you've been there like, for so long. It's, uh, you're not getting bored of making AC games. Like, man, it's every single game is a new setting. It's a new fantasy. It's a new challenge. Like the team has to design a whole country when they just made cities before with you know one unique style. Now we have the, the Norse architecture, we have the Saxon architecture, we have the Roman age era, post-apocalyptic runes, uh, covered vegetation, and, you know, all this stuff is so different. It's, it's like, for me, it's like making a new game. Every time it's a new game. 
yes, we have mechanics. We have um, the spine of the brand, you know, with the like visual reference and the, the gameplay mechanics. But uh, in terms of world building, it's always a new game. So uh, I, I would say we really wanted to push the Vikings on this one. And we also listening to, to the fans and uh, we have the, um, uh, how do you call that? The, the focus test, focus group. So we, we make this kind of uh, test and we, we see what is the trend and what the, the fans are really expecting. And usually the team, the developers like really match what the fan also like. So it's, uh, it's what we do. <laughs> yeah. So uh, do you remember the first time Assassin's Creed was pitched to you? Tell me about that. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, that's uh, 2005, I think, or 2006. I, I was, uh, I, so I left uh, the team, uh, was working on the on Sense of Time at this time, and I, I went to the cinematic department. So I've been working on the cutscenes and all the pre render stuff. And it was really interesting because I wanted to, to, to work more on the, on, on, you know, matte paintings and, and concept art, but uh, uh, really more connected to the narrative. So I really, you know, pushed myself in, in learning how to do matte paintings and, and uh, you know, pre-rendered cinematics. That was a great challenge. And then I've been in touch with uh, Jay Raymond uh, to join the, the, the game, uh, which was in pre-production. It was uh, AC1. So we I, I joined the team to, to help them with the matte paintings. And also I was doing concept arts on the game. So it was my, my first, you know, contact on the game and they saw I had a lot of experience. I've been working on a few games before and uh, also from the experience I had uh, as concept artist, they wanted to have me joining the team as production art director. So I was like directly working with the team, with the level design director, David Chatonov, and with uh, Patrice and all the, the team to bring to life the, the game. So I was not involved on all the conception, but it was more like a rough uh, Please embark on the on the ship, and it's now production time, big time. So I've been jumping directly in the action. It was not during the conception; it was just action uh, <laughs> from the start to to the shipping of this game. Yeah. So, what are some project settings and words you want to work, um, uh, but never had a chance to do? Oh, but there's there's a lot actually. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of settings and 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 time period. Uh, you know. Uh, it's it's not going to be like spoiling anything because people will be expecting some stuff. But uh, I, I would love maybe one day to to bring to life Babylon. That would be something. Uh, oh yeah, very interesting. Um, there's also all the the I would say the the Asian culture with the you know the the beauty of uh, of the the landscape and architecture there. That would be something really different and and interesting and challenging for us. Um, you know the the Ming Dynasty and uh, all the all the the the, the beautiful uh, landscape of China would be something really cool. Uh, uh, the Mayans, I don't know, the Aztec, the North America uh, before the invasion of the conquistadors. <laughs> um, all all this stuff would be uh, really interesting. And and for uh, Valhalla, I was really waiting and really expecting to work on the on the Norse setting because it's very different from the Mediterranean, you know, setting. And we've been Think a lot uh, uh, the Middle Ages and also the, the Renaissance ages and even like the ancient times around the uh, Mediterranean Sea. So being able to see the North Sea with the beautiful fjords, the, the spiky mountain of Norway, the Northern Lights, and all this stuff was really, really fresh and new. And uh, I was really waiting for this one. Yeah. How about space? I really want to see what you do creating a whole new galaxy, yeah? a planet. <laughs> and want to share. You're right. That's, that's going to be awesome. Uh, we could we could even make something, yeah, something more like uh, in space. That could be cool. There's so many options, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, still very open. Yeah. So uh, someone asked me an important question. Fortunately or unfortunately, we spend the whole day working from a disc. How do you manage your health, especially during this pandemic? What are your daily routines keeping your body healthy? Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, actually, I've been pretty enjoying this time uh, being at home because I, I was spending more time with the family, with my kids. I was able to to help my daughter, you know, doing her, you know, uh, homework and she had a lot of uh, uh, joining the the, the secondary, secondary secondary grade she had a lot of work to do so um 
it was great for me to to be able to to be there for her and help her and so so be be next to to you know i would think the very important things of the family and being like a safe as well was very important for me um i i'm lucky enough to have to have a, an office at home so i have a place that is closed uh, I, I feel it's for sure it's a privilege because some people, if they live in an apartment, they, they need to work maybe in the kitchen or in the living room, and then you have the kids running around and uh, you know and yelling, and then it's <laughs> starting to be uh, very messy. So um, as I have a place where you know I can really close the door and and I can work, I don't have. I, I didn't feel it was too difficult to be uh, to be uh, in the door for like so so many months. Uh, but uh, for the uh, I would say the health. Um, that's uh, that's very important. Uh, I'm going out every day. I need to 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 go for a walk. Uh, usually, even in winter, um, I go uh, cross country skiing. Skiing. Um, it's uh, we have a very long winter in Montreal, but uh, if you take the time to do uh, outdoors activities and uh, and skiing, it's uh, it's 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 great. It's cool. It's pretty cold, but uh, you you get you get used to that if you have the good equipment. So yeah, I would say like uh, hikes, uh, a lot of walking, try to do your like uh, 6,000 or maybe 10,000, you know, <laughs> steps per day. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, don't, don't just uh, stay working uh, all the time in front of the computer. And, and I know it's difficult because when you're not in the office, when you're at home, you have so many stimulation all the time. You can be on the social networks, you can have notifications all the time. Uh, you go for dinner and then oh i have a notification i have to go back just go up upstairs and, and work on the computer and uh, and yeah there's so many solicitation that you you have to be careful and that i think at the beginning of the pandemic some people got uh, burnt out because they didn't know how to balance the private life and and the work yeah so uh, let's ask some curious questions uh what is your favorite assassin creed as a gamer hmm that's a good question. I would say Origins. Ah, oh. <laughs> right. So, which assassin, uh, which Assassin's Creed was the most fun to work on? Most fun to work on, I would, uh, I would say uh, maybe Black Flag. Um, the, the the mood we had on the team was amazing. There, there was such a great mood. I think it's not only the fantasy being able to work on a on the pirate game, but it was. Uh, I think it was like we were still a bit. Uh, uh, I would say like a bit younger, uh, there was a lot of, lot of energy in the team and, uh, the, 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 the thing we've been working on was, was really exciting and, and super, super interesting, super cool. Also, it was a quite short production. So we're not like super tired at the end. It was, I think it was something like two years of production and, and, um, and we did something cool and great. And I think we were like super proud of this, of this game. I think we had the best launch party on, uh, on the AC4 Black Flag. It was, uh, it was, yeah, it was great. I think it's one of the best memory I have uh, as uh, as a production, as fun to make. Yeah, pirates are fun. Who is your favorite assassin? My favorite assassin? Oh, that's a tricky question. I love the Ezio from Revelation. Um, I love the, uh, yeah, the old wolf, this guy, uh, a bit grumpy, super charismatic. And I think uh, one of the best trailers we had with Digic was the the one of Revelation when you when you see Ezio coming to Masyaf and um, and then arriving in Constantinople on his boat. Uh, there's uh, really something magical about this one. It's it's uh, it's I love this trailer. I, I love this trailer so much. So yeah, maybe Ezio from Revelation. I would say. Yeah. So uh, what was the last inspiring game you played? Oh. The last inspiring. Um, there were two actually. I would say uh, Alex. I've been playing uh, Alex oh, in VR. Half Life. It's uh, it's stunning. It's really impressive to see how much attention they pay to details, and uh, it's so immersive. It's scary uh, <laughs> if you play this game. Um, it's it's impressive because it's a, it's a VR game, so they, they need to optimize a lot for the VR for to to get the good frame rate and. Uh, and the level of detail is still absolutely incredible. Uh, the lighting, the immersion is is fantastic. The mechanics, the physics. So I would say Alex and, uh, and for sure Red Dead Redemption. I love Red Dead Redemption. Uh, I've been playing maybe 150 hours this wow. game. Um, I, I've been going through the, the main path, uh, but uh, mainly just, uh, you know, exploring the world, spending time discovering mysteries. And that's also something I love to do in, on, on Origins. Um, you know, I'm a kind of a completionist. I like to 
take a lot of time exploring the world and finding all the treasures and, and also clearing all the locations, making sure that like, uh, I've been everywhere. Uh, and I will play Valhalla the same way I played Origins, I think. But uh, I would say like for sure, Red Dead is, is it's, uh, no, it's, uh, it's the reference. It's the, it's the most uh, impressive game, I would say, uh, as an open world and the most polished open world game, I would say, graphically as well. Yeah. Uh, you talked about Origin. Um, I remember playing that game and it was a very strange experience I had. When I reached the top of the Great Pyramid, I burst into tears because oh, yeah. since I was a child, I was so much into uh, Egypt and the uh, kind of history of that country and just being able to go up there virtually within a game that really that was a hell of a moment that was a fucking great mm -hmm. game <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's actually i i totally get uh, what you're saying there the, we and that's uh, that's amazing if if people can feel emotion in the game because uh, i would say sometimes the the main um things we 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 hear when we talk about assassin's creed in the would say like the 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 general public will, will 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 be very sensitive to the historical construction, and they will feel more like it's a scientific uh, approach. But we know, as a team, it's not the case. It's not about like making something for historians and making a documentary. It's to to leave the fantasy of being able to travel in time and feel emotions to be immersed in these times. So, for instance, like you were saying about. Uh, you know, having this uh, emotion when you climb the pyramid, and it's exactly what we want to feel. We want to feel emotions. And uh, when, when, you, when you see the sunrise on the Black Mountain, for instance, and when you see the Northern Lights, when you're alone in, in the isolated peaks of nowhere, that's something we want to, to make. It's not like made just, uh, you know, by mistake. It's really something we, we want to push, push the emotion in the immersion. And I, I'm a bit sad to see that... Uh, Sometimes the, the, the perception of Assassin's Creed is like, oh, you're not historical enough. Uh, this was not <laughs> like that at the time. You know, it's not, we're not making a documentary. We're making something that is really to, uh, to, to it's, it has to be authentic and respectful for the culture, for the people. Because when you're uh, creating a Viking game, you don't want to make the cliche of the Vikings. You want to be authentic. You want to respect the culture. And the best compliment I can have is usually when I have Egyptian people telling me, oh, I felt exactly the light from my village when I was in, in Siwa. Uh, what you did, guys, was amazing. I really feel, I mean, Egypt, but it's, uh, it's your like a perception. It's an aesthetic vision of Egypt, and I love this interpretation. Or when I have Norwegian people, people from Norway saying to me, oh, it looks exactly like uh, the light I have when I wake up in my fjord. That's the best thing I can have because I feel we, re we respected the people, but still, it's, it's, uh, it's a fiction. And it's a creation. Yeah. So uh, what was the last inspiring film you watched? The last inspiring film I watched? Uh, oh, that's uh, where we, we see so many films. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a tricky one. Um, actually, no, we're watching a lot of TV series as well. So it's... Uh, and also because of the pandemic, we've been... You know, away from the theaters for a long time. It's a, uh, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit of shame. Um, actually, now I'm watching uh, Babylon Berlin, which is a, a very good uh, TV series. It's very, pretty impressive. It's the, the, you know, the Germany from the 1930s. It's not a, a, a nice time period. It's not. A, it's very, uh, it's very. Uh, I would say like uh, stressful as a, as a period, and also very contrasted. Like you feel the poverty and the, the, the rise of. Uh, uh, you know, very bad things in Germany. So it's uh, it's an interesting setting, and it's very well, well very well done. I would say also uh, Fargo was a very good TV series. I really enjoyed it, and the the visual direction is absolutely uh, incredible in this uh, TV series as well. Um, yeah, there's there's a few. Uh, that I would say Interstellar well, because I love sci-fi as well. Uh, uh, I'm not a very fan of the plot, but uh, all the uh, I would say the 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 building of the the, you know, the movie and all the the all the introduction is absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a lot. So, uh, what what game other than Assassin's Creed do you like the most from Ubisoft? Uh, so, well, when, when I was uh, 
when I was, uh, yeah, back back in the days working on uh, Prince of Persia, I really liked uh, the Rayman. Simple games and uh, very efficient. Uh, also, Beyond Gone and Evil, I love the visual direction of this game. I think it was uh, it was uh, a very great creation. I can't wait to see uh, the, the, the two one day. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you know, back in the days as well, uh, I would say King Kong, uh, Montpellier did, did an amazing job on this game. Uh, it's a game after a movie, but I think it's a, it's a unique game, even if it's, you know, made after the theme of the movie. It's a, it's a very, I love that game. I played that game. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good game. Uh, it's, uh, the way you, they, they created all the mechanics and played with the scale. It's, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. It's pretty unique. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've been. I've been playing, I would say Assassin's Creed is, you know, pretty much the, 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 the kind of game I like because I like the open world. I like being able to escape from reality and not being immersed in something that is too realistic and too much in the modern times. And, uh, no, and, and, and I'm really bad with shooters. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not really playing shooters. I'm so bad. I'm, I would get a uh, hit like uh, in a second. So, <laughs> <laughs> so which, con- which country has the most inspiring setting for you? I would say lately, uh, it was Norway. Uh, I went to Norway uh, in uh, 2012 with my wife. Uh, we went for hikes in the summer. It was uh, it was absolutely st- stunning. Uh, I've been to Iceland as well. I love Iceland. I think what I like in these kind of uh, countries is that it, it looks from a, a, a different world. It, it doesn't look from... You know, like another it's planet. Not, yeah, it's exactly. It, it's uh, really otherworldly. And I, I really love when it's otherworldly because you can really feel like somewhere else and it's uh, fascinating i think it's really fascinating like some people would think it's uh, it's uh, it's a nice desert but i think it's uh, it's more than that it's it's really like being from another world and uh, i find this very inspiring uh also i went to scotland with uh, my friend ian McHugh, and uh, we did a hike in in sky the isle of sky it's also amazing and super impressive in terms of nature and landscapes yeah i love this kind of landscape yeah. So, uh, very, very important question. What's your favorite food? Oh, favorite food. Oh, that's tricky. <laughs> <laughs> I love Italian food. I love uh, pasta alla vongole. This, this, this one are, are pretty, pretty uh, excellent. No, I, I could it. eat pasta morning, uh, you know, and, and, and night, no problem. It's something, <laughs> it's pretty simple, but uh, yeah, I love, I love pasta. <laughs> Right. So, well, and actually, if you if you play uh, if you play Valhalla, Valhalla, we have a few uh, Easter eggs in the present day. You will see uh, maybe there's a connection oh. between Raphael and Pasta. You will see that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, uh, what's your favorite movie of all the time? Oh, that's uh, that's a tricky one because I, I will I will forget a few. I'm sure. Um, there's one when I was a kid. Uh, it's a French animation movie, um, and it's called The Time Masters. It was uh, directed by René Lalou, who, who is uh, who was uh, also one of my teachers in the animation school in in France back in the days. Uh, it, I say it's my favorite when I was a kid because I saw this movie when I was five, and I discovered uh, science fiction and fantasy at the same time through oh. this movie. Um, you, if you see now the movie has a lot of weakness in terms of, you know, animation, facial animation, but still the world is, is really incredible and fascinating. And, uh, also because the art director and vision uh, director was, uh, Moebius, you know, the, the French comic, uh, artist Jean Giraud he is, a you know, he was a pretty famous, uh, comic uh, artist and, and a friend of Miyazaki as well. So, uh, yeah, I love animation. I would say it's difficult to choose because, uh, I love, uh, you know, also uh, Castle in the Sky, Miyazaki. I've been watching all these movies with my kids. So, yeah, I would say animation is something uh, very strong. And, uh, oh, maybe, you know, Blade Runner as well. I read this card, the first one. Man, you got to do some sci-fi futuristic thing, man. <laughs> oh, yes. Maybe a oh, cyberpunk that's, that's game. In the plan. That's in the plans. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> it's going to happen. Right. So, uh, what's your favorite game of all the time? Favorite game of all the time. Um, you know, it's it's always difficult because you have your memories. Uh, when you were playing a game, I would say, like, I enjoyed so much playing uh, Abe's Odyssey when I was uh, 
well, I was maybe uh, 19 or, or 20 something. Uh, Abs Odyssey, I would say, were, I love this game, playing this game. It was, it was a huge challenge, but uh, I really love uh, playing this game. And um, after that, uh, I've been really into GTA V. I love this game. I spent a lot, <laughs> so much time just trying cars and uh, doing races and on the highway. Uh, you know, switching between the Bugatti to the Lamborghini. That was, that was, that's a nice <laughs> fantasy, I think. Uh, and yeah, Red Dead Redemption. I would say like Rockstar really nailed it in terms of open world. They are like really, for me, they're really the best in terms of, uh, you know, polish and experience. They, they take the time to finish the game. It's, uh, it's always very impressive. Yeah. Thank you so much, Raphael. Since I was a child, I've been raised by your artwork from uh, Prince of Persia to Assassin's Creed and your imagination has always been with me. And today is a very special day for me because I had a chance to talk to you. Thank you so much, sir. Hey, my pleasure, man. Yeah. It's uh, great to you reached me and uh, it was really uh, good uh, talking to you. Mm -hmm.